She received a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant for painting in 1997 and again, or previous, in 1993. She was also awarded the Jacob H. Lazarus Metropolitan Museum of Art Rome Prize Fellowship for painting by the American Academy in Rome for 1997-98. In 1995, she was a Marie Walsh Sharp Art Foundation Space Program resident, which I, I don't know more about that. And in 1993, she received the Richard and Hilda Rosenthal Award for the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So please join me in welcoming Sharon Horvath. Uh, 
relate. In this case, it's um, wicker, wicker, and waves, wicker and water. I found that that's where um, uniqueness or originality <laughs> comes from, not a particular image, but a combination of diverse imagery. This is um, a drawing on a single piece of paper, and it has um, a skeleton inside of it, as if, um, as if every piece of art has, is, a, is as a body, having muscle and bone and skin. If they don't have bones, you have to kind of put the bones in later. Uh, this is a piece from um, around um, 2011, I think. And I was struggling a little bit with um, representing the human figure. And so I, I went back to a platonic idea of um, the beginning of Human, um, human beings before they were separated into parts, before they were separated into male and female. They were um, singular balls rolling around as, as one. And I can't remember which deity it was that got angry at humans for their, um, their hubris and their pride. And so he uh, chopped them asunder so that we have these halves um, male, female, and um, apparently sometimes those halves were also mixed up. So there's a spectrum, as we know, between the two halves. Um, and the idea was that longing was created um, between the two halves that was never to be fulfilled, but it set in motion the desire to find that other half. So um, this is the ball of rolling humanness. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the dots and the lines a little bit later. Um, part of my process is um, dependent on water. I, I love the fluidity of um, water-based paint, and I love to work outside, even if I'm not drawing exactly what I'm looking at. I love to draw on the beach especially, where the wind is um, sort of a participant in the movement. And by accident, one day, I, by frustration, just stuck my big painting in the, in the ocean to erase it. And then I found out my real collaborator, um, because I couldn't erase it completely, but what was there after the waves took away all the superficial stuff was kind of like the bones that I needed. What, what, what remained seemed to be true enough. So <clears throat> I started to make it into a kind of habit, um, letting the leopards into the temple, which is um, a story maybe we can talk about later. So these are uh, paintings on Truro Beach in Cape Cod that had been made and then washed and now are drying in the, in the disappearing sun. Eventually, those pieces are brought back to the studio and worked on, and sometimes not to my canvas. So this slide shows um, my studio in Brooklyn around 2011. And um, the piece that you see on the wall is also hanging behind you, not on campus at, at this time. I work with um, sus a pigment suspended in uh, brown in water, and then the pigments are um, uh, binded together with any, um, any binder that you choose. If it's gum arabic, it turns into watercolor or wash. If it's polymer, it turns into acrylic. So I make my own paint out of pigment and binder. Sometimes I add um, secret ingredients. Um, so I pre-mix my, my paints in containers and um, usually cover them up. Um, 
we got a sneak peek at the questions that are going to be asked during the symposium. And um, one of them is about teaching and how teaching affects um, one's studio work. And, um, so I want to answer that question now a, a little bit. Um, it is a conflict when you leave your studio for three days and you get involved in empathizing for students and like thinking with them, getting getting inside their brains and uh, then you get back to your studio and that transitional period is, can be difficult. One time I got back to the studio after after days of teaching and I had forgotten to cover my paint containers and they had all dried and I was, you know, of course disappointed, but when I when I pulled out the dried paint shapes, I realized they were beautiful to me. Um, so, what you're seeing is dried paint that um, I either found on that first um, accidental day or um, that I made purposefully. So the, piece, the blue piece on the bottom, for instance, is a, um, is a mold of paint that I made in a, in a glass dish that had um, a, car a carpet. <laughs> so I acquired glassware, I, you know, my studio started to look like a kitchen, and I would, I would, you know, I would like purposefully um, make paint um, layered in these containers so that they would dry while I was teaching. And the idea was, while I'm teaching, my paintings are going to be making themselves. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> another big influence was my, um, my son, he was in first grade when, um, when I started to teach him how to throw a baseball. And um, he made, <laughs> he loved animals, so he put them together. And like I said, it's pretty interesting when things don't belong together. You have that, that, um, that halfway in between space where, um, where birds can play baseball. It's the space of the imagination. We've made many, many drawings of birds playing baseball. And I asked him if I could use his idea. And he was generous enough to say, yes, of course, Mom. <laughs> and now he wishes he had barked a little harder. <laughs> so, um, so I realized, you know, standing around at his um, Little League games for so many hours, that I really liked birds walking around in the outfield when he was playing right field, too. <laughs> so, um, so this is one of my this is one of my birds playing baseball um, collages. It's a it's a small piece, um, ten by ten inches. But you can see that I drew little notations while I was at the game. While I was at the little league game, I don't know. They're not really um, they're not really what I was seeing, but I was just watching, not looking at my page, because you never know what you're going to miss, um, not looking at the paper, but just keeping my hand moving. Because that's when you see more, right? When you try to draw something, you see more. So that's what you see. Um, I consider those kind of um, part of a series. Uh, one of the layers of my work is, is the blind part, blind drawing part of the method. Um, <clears throat> This is not a little league field. It's, um, it's a painting I did of Shea Stadium after after drawing on site. Um, another um, game board inspired baseball diamond. This is ten by ten inch. I'm working with um, iron oxide pigment and ink on paper, and then kind of washing it if if the paint. Um, seem to be sitting too much on top of the paper, I would wash it so that what was left was sitting in the paper, like a, like a fresco. So this is my most realistic painting that I'll be showing. Um, I started to try to just be as straightforward as possible. And still, some people look at this painting and don't see the baseball diamond. <laughs> Um, another theme um, happening at the time was, um, was the bed. For so many metaphorical reasons, I became fascinated with it. Um, 
not enough time, luckily, to go into why, but um, the bed offers so many spatial opportunities for an artist. I started to combine the bed and the baseball field. I mean, I would collect stories like um, there was a, an old Yankee Stadium, or maybe it was Wrigley Field. The groundskeeper was called Diamond Doctor, and he had a little bedroom, like in the outfield, like through the wall. And um, I just love, <laughs> I love thinking about um, the Diamond Doctor in his bed, waking up to the field, the Legion field. Um, so when you have two things that don't belong together, you just pick up a pencil or a brush and you play with how to combine them and surprise yourself and um, how the forms melt into each other. Um, this is a larger painting from, I don't know, it was the late aughts. Um, I started to really work with the above and the below that, that the bed um, could support. Who doesn't like to look at a baseball stadium all lit up at night? When you're, when you're flying to an airport, you see them all over our country. It's kind of like, it's, it's a place where you, when you're on that diamond, or you see that diamond, it's, it's almost eternal. No matter what baseball diamond you're on, it's the same diamond. So, um, at one point, I stopped, being, I stopped wanting to be literal about the color. But in fact, this large field, it's almost as if I was, was on the field and then I just kind of looked up and the vision turned blue. This is called in a mirror. It's about, um, about six feet tall, five feet wide or so. Um, all the while, I'm drawing, you can, see, you can see the pencil drawings of various um, experiences that are like incomplete perceptions, and then I would take them back and um, work with pigment in the studio from memory. And this is a small drawing, about 10 by 10 inches, and in the end, <coughs> as a collaged sort of foundation for this um, bed field called the afterlife. This, this sort of uh, painting, which is um, it's quite large, um, took about five years. A lot of my larger paintings take that long. I find that color comes from like, pairs of colors. There's, there's never a color in isolation. Um, so I become enamored. I'm looking at Judith's stained glass window over there. And I'm like, really, I'm really turning off that. <laughs> but, um, that's the kind of luminosity that one would wish for. As if the light is coming from the I can teach you. <laughs> I painted this painting three times. You know, there's always this question, how do you know if the painting was done? Um, it, came, it was shown twice. I came back from the gallery twice. I worked on it each time and set it out again. Um, and this is the final version. Um, so all in all, I worked on this painting for about, about seven years. Um, so when a painting is done, it's uh, finishing paintings is kind of overrated. I mean, it's like you get married and it's finished and then it might be undone. <laughs> you have to redo. So in the end, I feel like I was, I was very lucky to be revisited by the rejected painting, rejected, sent back home. I, I uh, have another theme that 
weaves throughout all the work, which is um, the night sky, and along with that baseball painting, this is another super realistic painting for me, the night sky. It happens to be a box of night. This is a, a painting that's about 48 by 50 inches. over me, and it is a sarcophagus, sort of a double sarcophagus. There was a, I shouldn't talk about the image that I can't show, but um, there's a double couch in the Metropolitan Museum, it's a, it's a Roman bed, and it has, instead of a pillow on one end, it has pillows on both ends, and I, I, I like that idea of a kind of a, a, twin, a twin bed that is um, for a double, a double-headed body. So this was my uh, first step at working um, with, directly with the theme of mortality. mortality. Why did I? Why did I include this slide? <laughs> <laughs> Painting is a process, and we all like to know, like how you know how you put the paint down, how you, how you do work with the glass. But um, sometimes the fact that painting is an exhausting physical <laughs> uh, activity um, gets passed over, but it indeed is. And um, the other thing is, it's not just exhaustion, but, but sleep is very important uh, to to the work. Finding um, that place from which the work flows, the daydreaming, the dreaming. So um, I did a whole body of work in 2011. It was after my father passed away. He was an artist. And I was, for the first time, really wanting to address the human figure. Um, I don't really understand why to paint a human body without understanding what I want them to be doing. So I want them to be doing something extremely essential, like sleeping or being haunted. Or in combat or in, in um, union. And also around this time, I started to um, work with phosphorescent pigment. So what it means is that you don't see the phosphorescence when you're looking at the piece in daylight. But at night, it has a different life. It has a whole different image that you see and is revealed. You don't see the daytime image at all. You see it's, it's night life. So another reason for these um, these dots of phosphorescence is that I felt like I was taking the night sky paintings and putting them through a kind of compression so that the night itself became like a dark line that contained the circulation of the stars. So I know they look a little bit like super dense constellations. I was thinking of um, night lines here in the stars, like a sort of cosmic circulation. I was looking at Japanese um, Shunka prints. Um, some of you might know them as the erotic, very explicit erotic um, depictions. Um, from, anyway, I would. I would take the configuration exactly and then um, sort of camouflage it with stars. Whether or not people were having sex or whether they were dying or killing each other um, was meant to be ambiguous in this, in this work. It was a mystery to me, too. Um, I was doing yoga seriously for the first time, and I started to think about the body and position, and pose, and, um, and energy. And so um, that's what I can say about this one. More about that later, maybe. Um, 
horses were <coughs> horses appeared as a, a sort of memory um, talisman. Um, I was thinking about time and the backwards and forwardness of, of time. And the vehicle in, in these pictures were, was the horse. I'm kind of literal, so I need I need a literal vehicle to like get on it, get with the wheels. <laughs> Um, so, what you see here on the red tray is um, a, a few of the hundreds of uh, paint mold shapes that I have collected in my studio. I also have lots of photographic um, newspaper clippings, um, and I shove them all in drawers together in no particular order, and I drive myself crazy trying to sort them out. But this sorting is part of my process. I, I, I came to realize that as I see these juxtapositions that are accidental, I get real, I get really inspired. So, um, so this is uh, an example of what it looks like when you open one of my flat pile doors. Um, another vehicle that I became interested in was the car. I started to um, get so bored with all my driving that I had a pad of paper next to me in the passenger seat, and I would just draw with my right hand, drive with my left, eyes on the road. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I was paying actually more attention when I, when I was drawing. I, I was seeing more. And I started to just become intrigued with the car as a, as a metaphor, as an image, just like baseball diamonds like don't belong. You know, in, in paintings, maybe like cars didn't really seem to be part of my art practice, but I decided to try to um, incorporate that real experience in my life that took so, so many hours. So the main thing about the car was the, the windshield. It's like a, a movie screen that you go through life. You know, that's your frame of reference. But it's multiple. You have your side views. You have your forward views. You have your rear view. So um, I drove back and forth to my hometown in Ohio for many, many years. And um, I just started kind of like tripping about on the, um, on the mirror. It's like you're shooting forward on the road, but I'm going to my past where I grew up in Ohio. And I look in the mirror and I can see my recent past like shooting away from me. And so there's this forward and backwardness in time that's literally embodied in the, in, the, in the space of the car. And then plus there's all these other rear premieres that give you various angles in it, like you're inside a cutest painting. So this little painting um, has a couple of mirrors, and I'm not sure how clearly you can see the, um, the reflective road. <coughs> it's happy to be heading for the ocean, but never mind, it's just a picture. Um, this is one of my car stadium paintings. It's about the car. Um, it's about four feet tall. So again, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to like meld these images together that um, are of different scales. One is the private bed or the private car space versus the, the stadium space. And how you, how this coexist um, in your mind woven together. Um, another super realistic painting of mine, the dashboard. I've been told that it is more like a, um, a, a spaceship, which I'll definitely embrace that. This is about four foot canvas paper <coughs> mounted on canvas. Simplification became important so uh, possible. Consider this my um, sort of like an endpoint of a certain um, body of work. I was trying to um, plan a, a trip to India, and this is a painting I did as a sort of, um, it's, a, it's like a, almost like a forward memory. Before I went to India, um, I painted this enormous painting, trying to insert memories um, as, as wishes so that I could get there. Um, here's a small detail of um, collaged, collaged elements. In that painting, you can see it. In the upper center. 
Um, when I got to India, I um, saw many, many amazing, beautiful things, but also just walking around, around the streets um, uh, was the astonishing um, every, every day. This is somebody's house with, with a shrine, and um, there's so much to say about the beauty of this you know, humble uh, living area. There's a, court, there's a street corner in India for me. Um, I made some work while I was there. Um, and this was the first painting um, based on the Italo Calvino uh, collection of short stories called Cosmic Comics. So this painting is titled Cosmic Comics, and I highly recommend the short stories. It became a key book for me. Whether or not you're looking up or across or down or in became a sort of game for these work. I'm collaging my own drawings into the work as well as photographs. This is the larger painting um, that lives right behind you right now. I did it. Um, as a kind of homage, my, my father had uh, done a drawing in his hospital bed. Um, clouds from my room. I just looked out the window, drew the clouds on a, on a paper bag, and he wrote future painting. So I thought I should paint that painting for him. It took me about five years. <laughs> um, I didn't paint his painting, but um, I got his dark energy in, into it in the, in the form of. These clouds. Another um, another family-based uh, um, picture is this one called "Some Breathe Iron." I don't know why it's not totally. It's a little bit cropped, but anyway. Here, here's a detail where I include some of those painted molds. I, I call them medallions. Um, they include. They include ashes, um, pictures that my mother um, drew when she was 25 years old, tiny little pieces of uh, my father's ceramics. And I stuck them in there because um, the Cleveland Museum of Art was my first museum. I was growing up in Cleveland. And I, and I wanted to donate a picture to them. So in honor of my parents when they passed away. So when, when the museum chose this painting, I had another week of the painting and stuck in all these little amulets and secrets. So it's actually not just me in the museum, it's my parents too. And this painting, I believe, is out of a foyer. It's called At Daybreak. Um, uh, again, titled after one of Italo Calvino's amazing stories in which the narrator is a particle in the universe and uh, flipping back and forth through, um, through well, eons of time and space and with a, with a great sense of humor. So um, the previous painting, Some Breathe Iron, is a reference to microbes that are so deeply frozen in the earth They've evolved to actually breathe iron because there's nothing else to breathe. So we do have to adapt to our situation. I think my time is up, so I will be um, happy to answer any questions.
I used to be an oil painter. But, um, I was using it so thinly that um, I realized that I'm using this like, um, like as if it's acrylic. So I might as well just go with the water-based paint. So I like, I like making my own paint because when you have a pigment, it's kind of like the material. It's like the material. It's not just color from the color wheel. You know, it's not an idea of color. It's actual physical minerals and like physical stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I bind it together with whatever I have, whether it's blue or pink or color. Um, or yeah, and I like gluing stuff on, too. So, whatever, whatever's around, whatever moves. Speaking of gluing things on, I noticed that in some of your paintings you have, like, the little car and an astronaut and this one. Where do you get those clippings from? The New York Times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, my father was a, he was an artist and he was an illustrator, so he had these files. You know, that it, before the internet, you couldn't Google anything, and you would just keep clippings from Life Magazine. And um, I found his files, like, two, I don't know, 2010 or something, and I thought, oh my god, this is kind of what I'm doing in my studio. Even though I can Google anything, I, I need these paper clippings. I, I love the crappy color that you know you get in the, in the color um, reproductions of newspapers. And um, yeah, so sometimes I use his pictures from his file. I have them in my studio. Um, but a big file that he had was from the '60s, the Life magazine, like the whole the whole moonshot, the whole space race was like. Um, in the form of these cutout pictures in his, in his file labeled space. So I <laughs> I go to that and bring out the, the old astronaut suits. You know that astronaut um, suits were um, created and sewn by um, brassiere hangers, the, the women who, <laughs> <laughs> so, who learned to they, but um, what was the company that um, the Wonder Bra? The Wonder Bra. Um, 
before. Oh, no, I did. Yeah, I did. I, I talked about how um, when you have a picture of the night sky, and then think about like just attenuating the whole night, and just like pressing it like, into a black hole and like pulling it like a string. So the whole night sky is like that. And the stars are. sexual acts, but one can also see it as like this violence and this like this murder of each other. So why why leave that unclear? Well there's what we see and like what we call things, but then there's like the underworld. You know, we're all we're all we're, um, these energies are mixed together. That phrase, intentions are creatures of darkness. So, um, you know, when you're with somebody, when, when they die, it's the most intimate experience. And so, I, I feel like these experiences that we label are, um, you know, they're, they're not as separate as, as we have to make them to talk about them. And so, when you, when you start to represent a human, what are they doing? It's so ambiguous. You know, so in, in, the, in the piece behind you, um, somebody who's, originally it was somebody sliding into second base. <laughs> <laughs> Turned into this sensual woman, you know, um, on uh, her belly, and then there was this other woman kind of like running at the sex, or is that her spirit leaving her body? I mean, I don't know. We all, we're not, you know, we're not all, that's the, the beauty of the image. We all I mean, in real life, yeah, you're, you're doing one thing or the other. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, we're going to do just a quick technical switcheroo, and then um, Barbara Technock is going to come up for her talk. And for those of you that are standing, there are some chairs scattered throughout. If you'd like to sit for the next part of the talk, you are welcome to do so. Or if any of you are in the back and you want to move up front, there's the Yeah, try to squeeze in. Squeeze in. <laughs> Get frisky. It's like, can I actually pull off a piece with a dead pink unicorn in it? I would seriously like to try. And uh, in this case, I just completely uh, put something on. This is on the left. It's an original stained glass window from a church in Tattersall, England. Uh, Cromwell's troops destroyed a lot of stained glass, and they later they didn't have like board up service, so uh, they just dig them up and put them back together, but not in the right order. And uh, some of those windows are so amazing. You don't see a lot of well, you do now that there's an internet. There's easy access to tons of this stuff, but I never saw it until I was like 45 years old. I had no idea, and it's quite amazing. So uh, I particularly adore that window on the left, so I, I remade it my way. I have a vast uh, collection of images uh, very carefully put into file folders like people standing on the edge of a cliff. Uh, so it, because I can't have my own ideas, I have to have these folders so that I can have, get one. Handily. That's where ideas come from. They come from folders on hard drives. <laughs> and my sketch is on the <coughs> bottom here. That's it's not it's a big sketch. It's not quite that big. But I think I have a picture of the, the girl. I changed the girl. Yeah, I do. I actually made this girl in stained glass. This is what happens in my studio. These figures, I make them, and they sit around in Tupperware bins. Fully made in stained glass because I don't know how I want to finish the window. It took me something like six years to get to this figure and finish it. She just sat in a box until inspiration struck or a show deadline came up, which is a synonym for inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> the second, perhaps the first most important way I have ideas is that I don't have ideas. I actually literally draw them out of me. I constantly draw, and this is where I, I could, these are my teenage drawings. I was uh, persecuted as a uh, childhood artist for constantly drawing all over my papers, which would come back with uh, red marks on them saying, stop drawing all over your papers. And so when I was an art student and a painting major, I was in this very sort of inhibited search for, for like what would be my personal voice, but I was searching externally. And I was looking to see what my influences were, and I was painting kind of like Giotto, because I really like Giotto. And I was uh, constantly doing this, uh, painting like Francis Bacon, because I like Francis Bacon. Meanwhile, uh, I was also painting over the parts that weren't very good with gesso, and then I would always have a blank canvas at the end of the day. It was just this sort of perpetual creative honesty nightmare. <laughs> so in stained glass, which I figured was sort of, you know, right above the department of hair styling, um, that clearly doesn't matter in this world. So when I went into that class, I brought this stuff, which also clearly had no place in this world. And when I made the connection between those drawings and this material of glass, and uh, I became uh, uncritiquable. That's what you all want, students, if you're art students. The moment when nothing anyone says affects you in any way. Because, because of passion. I, I was so in love with this. And as someone with ADD, if you have ADD, you'll, you'll relate to this. I thought, this is the thing that will never be born. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna come. and of course, I have found a way to make it boring. I, uh, um, but unfortunately, I became fluent, and then it was too late. Uh, so I still draw. That's the. Uh, it's a little hard to see, isn't it? That's the craft faculty uh, meeting agenda for. Uh, some faculty meeting. I find faculty meetings to be the most inspiring thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think they are incredible. But the craft
craft conference in Minnesota a few years back, uh, I, I did 300 bird drawings in three days or something crazy like that. So that was really good, too. Best conference ever. I bet they put this stuff into Photoshop and sort of get rid of the text. Because there's one thing I understand is that text doesn't matter. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> You know, I'm actually extremely interested in the connection between um, image and words. My, I, I, this is part of my typical lecture, but I didn't include it here. My brother is uh, autistic, and he uh, didn't learn to speak until he was about 11. And my mother was a social worker, and very, very interested in neurology and human brains. And I remember her asking me, like, would you rather be blind or deaf? And I said, oh, definitely deaf. I'm planning on being a painter. And uh, <laughs> she was like, no, you're actually better off being blind because you need to have language to be an artist. And I'm like, say what? Um, <laughs> but I think, I think that relates to the child who's raised in isolation, uh, you know. Like, it has to do with um, re well, reaching what Lacan would call the symbolic stage. But we won't go into that today. You know, I put this in this lecture, and I really had to struggle, so I included these doodles so I could say how I drew this on a cocktail napkin, which is basically true. But the real reason I put it in here is I think this is one of my most beautiful pieces ever, and because the theme is beauty, I just wanted to show this uh, beautiful thing. I still think this is one of my most beautiful pieces. There's the doodles. And if you could turn it into a cylinder, it would be just one image. But don't you be doing that in stained glass and it doesn't bend. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my sketchbooks have reached this sort of crazy situation where it, you know, I used to get like really big, beautiful sketchbooks with acid free paper. And then I realized that when the sketchbook didn't fit on the table next to the couch, I wouldn't bother to stand up and reach three feet to get it. So it had to fit on the table next to me, or I wouldn't sketch. I don't care how ridiculous that sounds. I'm all about working with my ADD, not against it. So a little sketchbook, OK. And then I couldn't deal with white pages anymore. <laughs> so I get lined pages. And I don't like the idea of acid-free, because if it's precious, then I'm going to make a big, I can't make a mess. I get all inhibited. Just the way I did in painting class when I was thinking about art history. So I work on the most horrible sketchbooks possible. So this drawing on the uh, on the right led to this piece here, which was based on um, the idea of the odalisk, the um, odious odalisk, a tradition that really just doesn't look good light of today's culture. Oopsie. Anyway, mine's far too sexy, but she does have a funny face. <clears throat> Ignore the caption at the top. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was the, uh, <laughs> this. Um, I do a lot of stuff, <clears throat> and it doesn't come out right. It uh, occurs to me lately that uh, I used to get very angry with myself because I sometimes make these pieces several times, but then at one point it dawned on me that I would not necessarily know how to make it since this thing didn't exist in the world before. So why should I be any different than the rest of anyone? So I don't know what it's supposed to look like. Alright, now I'm just going to talk about technical stuff because people always want to know, and I did bring some samples with me that we can look at after the lecture if you're interested. So my pieces are not painted, but I'm going to just be misleading and start off with a piece that is all painted. So this is what it looks like finished, and this is what it looked like in progress. I sandblasted the glass with those silhouettes of those women to give it a texture, frosted, and sandblasting frost the glass. And then I drew the sketch on it with a Sharpie pen, and I covered it with glass paint. And with the glass paint, I went carefully over those lines and painted those dark lines, and I fired it in a kiln. The second pass with the paint looked like that. I go into the paint, and I remove some of it, and then I add more. And ultimately, it looked kind of like that. Those weird bubbles are um, 
a thing called matte painting. You basically paint the glass paint on with this thing called a badger blender and you squirt it with Windex and when it dries you brush it all off and it makes those weird bubbles. All right, this piece, which is about a bear stealing a baby. You can read into that what you want. <laughs> I'm going to show you the section of the girl holding the lantern. <clears throat> the glass is engraved in layers. The glass has two layers of color on it. I'm going to go over here and scream really loud. This is all of them together. And this is a piece of glass that, when I get it from uh, New Jersey, where glass is made, I'm just kidding, where glass is imported from Germany, um, it would be a sheet about so big that looks bright red. And this would be a sheet the same size that looks bright blue, and the other one would be a sheet that looks pink. Now, the secret to this glass is that it contains two layers of color, and you can remove what? And I remove it with various tools, like sandblasting, and in this case, I covered it with Elmer's glue. I just squirted it on, and wherever the glue is, it won't sandblast. And I also use hand-cut stencils made out of contact paper. Anything that's black is painted on with that paint that fires on, so this shadow. And this yellow stuff, I would like to say it's silver stick, but it's not. It's actually some sort of yellow, transparent paint. But uh, silver I do use silver stain, and in the next piece, I used it. And it's worth noting, silver stain is where the term stained glass comes from. It's just silver nitrate. It, you fire it on in a kiln at about 1,000 degrees, and it stains the glass yellow. So here is this piece called Feral Child, and I'll show you the area of the birds on the top. <clears throat> on the left top there is what it looked like when I first sandblasted it. And then on the left bottom, I go into it with various engraving tools, basically dentist drills. And they sound like dentist drills. And if I was weird, I would say, oh, why? But there's no one there but me. <laughs> so the red glass has all the paint on it and all the silver stain. And there's a pink glass layer and a blue glass layer. When you put it all together, it looks like that. There is nothing else going on there. I do not paint the colors on. I am removing the colors. And here's a close-up of the face. And this is the face taken apart. Now, Sharon, I was much taken with your discussion of what the planet looks like from an airplane at night. because. I actually think that's one of the most beautiful sights to hold. And as it turns out, that's Berlin. It didn't matter that that was Berlin. It was just the biggest JPEG on the internet that I could use for this. But I'm going to show you the, how the figure is engraved from beginning to end. It's all in the slide. <laughs> um, so I sandblast a little bit the blue. I draw on it with a magic marker where I want to engrave it. And then I engrave it with these tools. The, Tones are done with a hand file. It looks like a nail file. I have one with me. I'll show you. <laughs> it's really not interesting. Well, it's interesting to me. It looks like this. It looks like a little stick. You can all fondle the stick. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there showing this to a student, and you basically you go like this for like two weeks. That figure took two weeks to make. And it's about this big. And he was a film student. And he looked at me and he said, do you really enjoy that? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Do I have any time left? Yeah, you're good. OK, so people ask me, why glass? And I agree, why glass? This is the trajectory of the history of my medium. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there is something in it. <laughs> Glass will like to tell you that they've chosen glass because it's just so completely perfect with their conceptual program. However, they're lying. Everyone likes glass because it transmits light, and if you don't like transmitted light, that means that you were born on another planet, one without a sun. As I mentioned before, um, glass art cures the following conditions. <laughs> While this is leading me to discuss 
discuss my project at Eastern State Penitentiary, which was the only time my work was ever installed in architecture. This is an old engraving. It is the oldest penitentiary in the United States, meaning place of penance, and it's now a tourist site in Philadelphia. You should all come. It's where they built 12 monkeys. <clears throat> and it's an active arts uh, uh, venue. I proposed to make 10 stained glass windows, and I ended up making 17, which I installed in the stalls, in the cells, rather, which looked like mini chapels. Unfortunately, the pieces had to be removed, and I then put surrounds around them that would sort of imitate the uh, cells so that they would be autonomous from the site-specific installation. Yes, it did cast beautiful colored shadows. And look, it's this piece. This happens to be one of my favorite pieces I've ever made. Um, and you can see it was really skinny. The only the tiny strip in the middle fit into the cell uh, window. But I was so excited by the image, I, I finished it out as a large piece. The position of the figure is based on the girl who's been napalmed in Vietnam. You all recognized it, right? Right. We've seen that photo. <coughs> I also did a really giant window, which I wasn't going to do, but Sean Kelly told me it would be my masterpiece. And then I said to myself, what does he know about my masterpiece? What's, what's a masterpiece? You know, some pressure there. And then I just you know, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and uh, I decided I had to do it. And this, this piece changed my life. I literally became the person who had to have pizzas and matzos slid under the crack beneath their door. I totally changed my life. I no longer have any social life whatsoever. Uh, after making this piece, <laughs> it just ended my life. Because um, I only had six months to make it, and it's humongous. It was based loosely on this painting by Bruegel called The Battle of Carnival and Lent, which is basically an image of Mardi Gras. Here's it was supposed to be the seven cardinal sins versus the seven deadly, seven cardinal virtues versus the seven deadly sins. However, I do not believe in that. I just don't believe in good versus evil. It's just a lot of gray areas. That figure on the bottom is actually a Matthew Brady photograph of a dead soldier in the Antietam, but he didn't have those cool pants, <laughs> nor was it in color. And I was also loosely thinking about the idea of angel versus devil on one shoulder and sort of the idea that anyone who might have found themselves incarcerated in a real penitentiary or maybe just in one of their own making would have somehow lost that battle. <coughs> um, all right, so taking after that, that installation came down, this was the only window, by the way, that wasn't one of those really skinny ones. So I was really tired of working with these really skinny things, and I couldn't indulge my fetish for insane detail, except with this piece. So I want you to just hold this image in your mind, and then hold these two images in your mind. And then this was the next piece I did after Eastern State Penitentiary, which is a sort of mashup of those influences there. And I have a technical slide to show the layers separated. This, the drawing alone took months. It just seemed to really, there's no such thing as too much work for me. I could, I could do it, I could go in further and deeper and more. I could sandblast by throwing a single grain of sand at the glass and sandblast. <laughs> I am not someone who is obsessed with horses, except that I got really interested in images of horses and art. <clears throat> And here's this piece separated out with the colors. And here's the horse. I feel like I should hurry it up. Um, I do post work in progress to Instagram on the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, this is The Birth of Eve, another piece that I think is uh, beautiful. I was calling it, look, Ma, no rib. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Christian, by the way. I'm not religious at all. My father was Jewish, and my mother was Christian, so I have like uh, no religious affiliation myself. <clears throat> One thing that's become increasingly important to me is the idea of spontaneity. I don't work with drawings for these for the most part. It depends. I have at times worked with drawings. So the top part of this one is, was pretty much all improvised. 
The uh, Gothic image on the right is a anchorite. Anchorites were a sect that would um, voluntarily get bricked into the wall because they believed in solitude to that extent. Here's the figure. She was actually originally on that piece that I showed you when I was talking about those cosmic maps. But she didn't look good there, so she had to be moved. <laughs> and here's the pieces with the, the layers separate.